When we observe the sun, it is not possible to see inside of it. Using observations of the outside of the sun can provide clues to how the sun might be functioning. It is almost universally accepted that the sun is a thermonuclear engine whose purpose is to radiate excess energy liberated from matter deep in its core. Jürgens was one of the first to look at the evidence in a totally different light and propose a mechanism whereby the sun was not powered from within, but was driven externally, and that the light that we see was not from an internal thermonuclear reaction, but instead was from an external electric discharge. His model is both simple and complex. Simple to grasp the main concept, but much harder to understand the inner workings. I want to explore Jürgen's concept in more detail so that you can understand the mechanisms and the evidence that he saw and how this fits into the larger picture of the electric universe. In the first part, we will examine Jürgen's model and the granulation and tufting. This series will be split into a number of episodes focusing on specific aspects of the model and then understanding how this would operate within a galactic framework and then discussing how this model has been worked on further inside the EU community. One of the strangest aspects of the photosphere is its lumpy granular structure. Originally, Sir William Herschel thought that this was a sign that the sun had an atmosphere and that the glow came from brilliantly luminous clouds at the top of the atmosphere. Nowadays, we think these patches are formed by blobs of hot plasma. These are referred to as granulations and seem to exhibit a very uniform structure. These granulations are about a thousand kilometers in diameter and come and go in the space of minutes. Solar scientists were quick to identify these as the changing tops of convection currents, bringing light and heat from an unstable layer beneath and that it showed that the photospheric layers are in constant turbulent motion. Most astronomers are now fairly certain that these bright cells are the tops of columns of hot gases being rapidly transported from the depth to the surface. As they cool, these columns of hot gases begin to sink, and as an effect of cooling, they lose their brilliance and appearing dark by contrast to the hot ascending columns. The granules fail to live up to this expectation, True enough, observers report rapid upward motions and the speedy growth and decay of granules. These motions are, however, very orderly. The growing cycles are non-violent. These do not qualify as turbulent eruptions you would expect to find. Equally, the darker regions of the granules, where we would expect the cooler gases to be subsiding lower, should also have an equally chaotic pattern and it should be similar to the upwelling hot gases. Yet, we do not see any similarity between the light and the dark regions, and they also do not appear to have any chaotic structure. These dark areas almost appear as canals running between the bright areas. We often see the granules fading. These then tend to divide, and some seem to merge with others and bloom again. There is little evidence to suggest violent mixing and roiling to be expected in an homogeneous fluid stirred by strong convection currents. The peculiar motions of the photosphere also argue against the idea of turbulent convection. Near the solar equator, the period of rotation is about 25 days. As we move higher up, this changes to about 35 days. If convection currents were driving the material upwards, and then back down, you would expect this process to bring this difference back and cause a more uniform rotation. Now you may see examples of convections in hot wax, which look very similar to the granulations on the sun. This process is labeled as stationary convection. The problem is that this turns out not to be a process caused by convection at all. It is caused by a temperature dependence of the surface tension. These beautifully regular convection cells depend on capillary action and not on convection. Increase the depth of the wax just a little and these regular shapes disappear and the term non-stationary is applied. Despite this, solar scientists still claim that stationary convection causes the granulations on the sun. Another term that is used to describe this motion of the fluid is the Reynolds number. 
This tells you when a fluid is moving in a laminar flow. Think smoothly or turbulent. When you look at the Reynolds numbers required to produce these smooth convection cells, it comes out at 10 to the power of 3. When we examine the surface of the Sun, calculations put this number at 10 to the power of 11, which is 100 billion times greater than that required for laminar flow. In other words, it would be extremely turbulent, yet we do not see this turbulence in the granules. But why do we think there is convection in the first place? Part of the reason relates to the fact that we cannot see beneath the bright photosphere. The argument given is that deep inside the Sun, thermonuclear reactions go on and liberate energy. This energy struggles to escape. Initially, this proceeds as radiation. At some depth below the surface, their path is blocked because the gases here have become opaque and are absorbing the radiation. They heat up, become less dense and rise up. A convective process is set up transporting the hotter gases upward towards the surface. At the surface, the rising cell of gas unload their radiation energy into space. They cool and increase their density and plunge back downwards. The problem is that as you move outwards from the center, the density of the gas will naturally become less and less. And this means that as the convection column approaches the upper layers, more and more turbulence will be present. And again, we do not see this in the granules on the surface. Granules can be viewed as relatively dense, high luminous secondary plasma that springs into being in the embrace of a primary plasma about a current stressed anode in a low pressure gas electric discharge. Both media are largely hydrogen gas ionized to the plasma state. Based on this critical distinction between the cathode and anode phenomenon, Jurgens assigned the solar body the role of the anode, that is, the more positive electrode in a cosmical electric discharge. It is therefore quite apparent that the granules have a striking similarity to the highly luminous tufts of discharge plasma, often referred to as anode tufts. These are many times more luminous than the surrounding plasma. They have a sharp outline and are bounded by a transition zone and not by true surfaces. You should already start to see the similarities between the granules on the sun and the anode tufts. Irving Langmuir spent a long time studying these tufts in the laboratory. These anode tufts appear at evenly spaced points of the electric breakdown in an anode sheath. When the electric current to the anode becomes excessive, breakdown occurs and this really means further ionization of the medium and a second plasma will form within the first. It is important to realize that these particles of matter in the discharge plasma have two kinds of motion. Random thermal motion, which is reflected in the temperature of the various particles, electrons, positive ions, and electrically neutral particles. These will have differing speeds. Typically, electrons will have the highest random motion due to their small mass. The second type of motion is drift motion. These are in response to a weak electric field that exists within the extensive positive column region of the discharge plasma. The electrons will tend to drift towards the anode, while the positive ions will drift in the opposite direction. The drift of these two constitutes a drift current and represents the entire electric current of the discharge plasma. In order to maintain a steady discharge, the anode must collect an uninterrupted stream of electrons, which must be equal to the total drift current in the cross section of the discharge plasma. The random motions of the electrons are usually more energetic than their drift motion. If the anode was in direct contact with the plasma, then due to the electrons increased motions and the positive ions moving in the opposite direction, the overall current collected by the anode would be more than the discharge could sustain and an instability would result. This may be an alternative explanation for highly variable stars. The remedy for this is to allow the anode to disengage from the plasma. Initially, it accepts a certain number of excess electrons and takes on a slightly negative charge relative to the plasma, which will end up repelling all but the most energetic of the electrons. And this allows the anode to manage the incoming current to allow the electron flow to equal that carried by the discharge plasma.
any electrons which are rejected are returned to the plasma, leaving behind a thin sheath of positive space charge between the plasma and the anode surface. The sheath therefore limits the electric field due to the excess negative charge taken on by the anode in making its adjustment. If the surface area of the anode was reduced, then it would mean that the current density at the anode surface would have to exceed that in the discharge plasma. It would need to collect more of the random current to make up the difference. In this case, the anode could give up some of its electrons, increasing its relative potential, creating a smaller potential drop between the surface and the outer discharge plasma. If the anode size is reduced further, this potential difference would continue to drop until there would be no need for a sheath and the anode would be in direct contact with the plasma. That is the situation for white dwarf stars, which are lit by their faint white corona. Continue to reduce the size further and now the plasma is no longer able to supply the required electrons. The anode must enlarge itself. It does this through the creation of a space charge sheath, which is now negative. It achieves this by removing some of its electrons and acquiring a positive bias. The sheath will grow until its surface can collect the required electrons to satisfy the discharge current. The outer boundary of the sheath becomes the effective anode surface. This is the situation for red stars, that is those without a bright photosphere, which accounts for the giant and variable apparent size. As we shrink the anode, this process continues until the electrons are attracted to the electric field with enough speed to start ionizing some of the surrounding neutral material. At this point, the entire sheath will start to glow. As this process continues, more and more ionization takes place and the sheath itself will start to break down. At this point, tufts on the secondary plasma will start to appear. The faint glow of the sheath gives way to the birth of highly luminous plasma. The breakdown on the tufts yields electrons deliverable to the anode and also provides positive ions that are driven in the opposite direction. Tufts themselves have been studied for a long time and we know that the structure that they take very well. In the following diagram you will see how the potential changes across the tufts. We can see that there are effectively three sheaths. They're labelled as two, one is a double sheath and one is a single sheath. So starting at the bottom, so where the anode would be, we would see a positive space charge between the anode and the secondary plasma, the tuft. We would then see another positive space charge just on the other side of the tuft, and then further out, which would be in our case towards the, chromos the top end of the chromosphere, towards the corona, we would see a negative space charge. Now this shows that the anode potential is higher than the primary plasma, but lower than the tuft plasma. This need not always be the case, as the anode can limit the influx of electrons, this can drive potential to drop below the primary plasma. Observations of Fraunhofer lines on the photosphere, and these are spectrographic absorption features, strongly suggest that both neutral atoms and positive ions drift downwards between the granules. This is generally accepted as evidence of a descending bulk gas motions, but if the motions of these positive ions were electrically induced, as we are proposing, these would naturally cause the neutral atoms to drift with them through a sort of electric wind effect. The same Fraunhofer lines are much broader in the darker spaces between the granules, this is normally attributed to turbulence in the medium. Why would they be more violent in these darker regions compared to the brighter granules? An alternative would be that the observed broadening arises instead from the emissions of radiation in an electric field. This is called the Stark effect. In the electric sun hypothesis, the first true plasma we come to above the photosphere is the solar corona. Below the corona and above the photosphere is the chromosphere, a region whose reddish glow shines forth during solar eclipses. The observed temperature minimum just above the photosphere marks the beginning of the concave upward wing of the double sheath curve, 
of the diagram that we previously looked at. Here the electric field is at its most intense, and this means that the entire chromosphere, therefore, must be a region of negative space charge, which is another quality of an anode glow region. The chromosphere is far from quiet though. In many ways, its structure is more complex than the tufted photosphere. Its lower regions are ravaged by many different effects, some of which include short-lived jets called spicules, erupting prominences, and explosive solar flares. These may all attest to the difficulties related to the maintenance of a stable discharge. The electric sun must maintain a steady stream of electrons to maintain the external plasma in the tufts. This requires dozens and dozens of electrons from the corona plasma to enter the sheath for each positive ion that leaves in the opposite direction. As the corona is fully ionized, it has a ready supply of electrons, but they are not endless. These spicules may be a mechanism to allow the sun to replenish the electrons in the corona as they spew vast quantities of ions and electrons into the corona. Any electron that reaches the anode must do so by passing through a sheath that tends to slow them down and send them back to the tuft. The electric field in this sheath tends to send positive ions to the anode, and indeed many of them produced in the tuft must find their way to the anode, where they are undoubtedly deionized and restored to a neutral atom. Only electrons with the energies in excess of a certain minimum value make it across this anode sheath. An excess of impurities in the plasma, such as other more easily ionizable atoms like iron, could mean that, relatively speaking, more of them will become ionized. In turn, the plasma will become relatively overpopulated with lower energy electrons released by these easy ionizations, and this could clog up the whole system. A tuft is therefore a sort of trap in which electrons of lower energies must tend to accumulate. The degree to which this occurs must affect the negative space charge within the tuft and cause it to increase over time. This means that the electric potential of the tuft plasma with respect to the primary plasma must decrease over time. But this will cause a lowering of the barrier to the anode and will allow some of the lower energy electrons to reach the anode. If this continues, the tuft itself may be totally disabled. Now the double sheath starts to collapse and the incoming electrons are no longer accelerated. Deionization quickly sets in, spreading rapidly. The light of the tuft begins to fade and the once brilliantly bright blob goes away. The photosphere as a whole seems to add up to yet another strong indication that the sun draws its energy not from within itself but from its cosmical environment and that the delivery mechanism is an electric discharge embracing the entire solar system. In the next part we will examine how this system functions on a larger scale, how it receives the incoming current and how this may account for differences in the population of stars that we see across the galaxy. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.